Father, we thank you so much for this opportunity to just stop and think. In all the busyness of life, where we have all these details to attend to, not just the mundane details, but sometimes the challenges of life, financial, physical, relationship problems, they just consume us. And so it's great when we could just stop for a moment and just think about the things of God. And especially in this context where we're trying to be faithful stewards of our mission on earth, faithful stewards of this trust to take the message of the gospel outside of our own closed environments into a world that's seeking and searching, a world that comes from all kinds of different cultural contexts. And Father, we don't want to be a people that out of fear and ignorance create walls between us and them. We want through understanding and love and compassion to build a reputation of a people who just reflect the glory of God in the way they speak, in the way they live. So that through our actions, through our words, through our understanding, through our love, people will see the truth of God. And so our prayer today is as we look through this religion called Hinduism, that you would allow us to open our hearts and minds to really hear what these people think and feel so that as we dialogue with them, it would be an authentic, transparent, um, illuminating experience for them and even for us as we seek to follow you and learn to know you better. We ask this in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. Well, thank you very much. We're progressing now to our third session. We're going to talk about the religion that is called Hinduism. We're going to do it in two parts. Because I'm fundamentally fundamentally an historian, I like to do these things historically. One way to approach the subject of the religion is to give you their fundamental beliefs, their fundamental assumptions, their fundamental practices, and kind of assume that we've walked through it. But as a historian, I think there's appreci- we should build an appreciation for how these religions develop. Uh, Christianity itself didn't develop overnight. As you well know, even you students of the Bible, you understand that God himself and the way he revealed himself through people, revealed himself through time and through different cultures over time. And that enhances and um, enriches the story. And the same thing with regard to Hinduism and some of these other religions, we're going to find that it's not a static thing. It's not a box that we can all look at. It's a tradition that's evolved over centuries. And for us to appreciate the fact that It's not a one-size-fits-all experience. It's not like you can list five things or six things that they believe or seven things that they practice and say, that's it. There's a whole rich variety of tradition that uh, works its way into people's lives from these different traditions. And I think if we're going to be authentic witnesses to Christ and have authentic dialogues with these folks, we should be aware of how their tradition emerged and developed over centuries And this is especially true of this religion we're about to undertake here called Hinduism. We'll start this week with the origins and get to a certain period, and then next week we'll pick up, or not next week, two weeks from tonight, we'll pick up on the subject of some later developments and maybe make some conclusions at that point. So let me just start off with a few preliminary considerations before we get really into the story. And the first thing we need to do is talk about this word Hindu. Um... You remember last week when we talked about religious indigenous traditions, I pointed out that it's kind of an anomaly for them to think about themselves as religious. For those traditions, there's no such thing as religion and secular life. That division doesn't exist. Life is religious. There's no, there's no distinction. And in some regards, this is the same thing that's true of Hinduism. It's not a religion as such. In fact, um, they would not even use the, initially they wouldn't even describe themselves in Hinduism when it started. It's a foreign word, if you will. It's a foreign word that comes traced back to the Persians who were referring to a people that lived along the Indus River Valley. And some would say it's Sanskrit for the word river in general. And it's just, these were the people that lived in this river valley, which in Sanskrit is Sintus. And so They became known as Hindus. So it's a Persian word. So it's not even emerging out of India. It's not even a a local word. But over time, that word stuck. 
and is used to describe a whole religious tradition and evolved over centuries to that point. So we're going to use that term, uh, even though, again, in some respects, it refers to a religion, but we just have to understand that it comes, that term itself comes from an external source. And just to also point out a little bit in terms of um, size and scope and distribution, there's about a billion Hindus in the world. It's the third largest religion after Christianity and Islam. So huge number of those there, most of which, over a billion of which live in India, Nepal, and South Asia, that area. There are some two million plus by latest counts of of Hindus that live in the United States. So the point is, it's a huge cultural uh, tradition. And it's scattered all over uh, Europe, all over Asia, all over Southeast Asia, all over the world, really. And so uh, predominantly in India and Nepal, there are major religions in those sections. Sometimes we think of Nepal as primarily Buddhist, but uh, the Hindu culture is very strong there. So it's a large chunk of people that we're talking about here. So we're going to look at that. Uh, We're going to look at at this religion and realize that there's a lot of dialogue that goes on here. And there are some challenges with talking about this tradition. And uh, again, it's a very complex tradition. On one level, it seems kind of silly to try to describe it in two sessions. I mean... It can't be done, but we're going to give it a shot. As I said, it doesn't really, they don't really view it as a religion itself. In fact, the early texts, when they talk about their faith, they call it the Sanatana Dharma, which basically means the eternal way, the eternal path. That's their view of what they're talking about. It's the eternal way to uh, release that we're going to talk about as we develop. So, again, it's it's, are we talking here about a religion, a separate set of doctrines? Well, not really. Part of the essence of Hinduism is there's no fixed beginning. It's not as if we had a founder, like Islam or Christianity, or even Judaism, if you want to trace it back to Abraham. There's no founder like that. There's no first. And so it, it's more of a religious culture that emerged over time. And so it is a very definitely a culture that emerged uh, through centuries and through all kinds of interactions with other cultures. So when you say, let's study Hinduism, are you saying it's not, you're not studying a fixed box of a religious orthodox system? There's no one set of scriptures that you can go to and say, this is Hinduism. There's no one founder's work or life that you can study and say, this is Hinduism. There's a long pages and pages of scripture, pages and pages of, of tradition. And so we're going to kind of have to get our arms around the fact that this is a very complex movement, cultural reality, not just a fixed box kind of religion. The other problem is, do we view it from within and without? And this is the same problem we had when we talked about indigenous religious traditions, how there was this 18th, 19th century bias that went into these areas of Africa and Indonesia and and other places and American Indians and kind of imported Western thoughts and Western ideas and Western structures into them and interpreted everything they saw by virtue of this Western view of God and Western view of religion. Uh, The same is true of Hinduism. A lot of the early interpretation, a lot of the early work, especially uh, the French work and then later, of course, the British work, they're importing things into that and we're seeing a lot of understanding of Hinduism come down to us from this external source. And so we're going to have to kind of always be sensitive to the fact that are we looking at Hinduism as an outsider, as a Westerner, or are we going to try to get inside the mind of the folks that are actually living that way? Let's not attribute to them things we think they're thinking. (laughs) Let's actually listen to what they are really thinking and try to understand. So that's always a challenge. The other challenge we're going to have when we look at the subject of Hinduism is its rich diversity. Hinduism has this feature that it's comfortable with contradiction. It's comfortable with multiple interpretations. It's comfortable with hundreds of different stories of creation. They don't see 
any, any contradictions or any um, uh, uh, problem with multiple ways that the world was created. They don't see a problem with saying there is one God and there are many gods. To them, it's just two sides of the same truth. And so you're going to see over and over again, and again, you're going to try to want to put Hinduism in a box and say, what are the five things or the six doctrines or the four paths? You're going to want to put it, you know, I'm teaching this again, I teach this uh, in a college, and everybody wants to know what's going to be on the test. Like, how do you define the word? (laughs) Because I want to know. But Hinduism kind of excels at defying definition. It's diverse and it's comfortable with, uh, with different levels of mystery and different levels of openness. And so it's going to be a little frustrating for us as Westerners and as Christians as we go in and try to understand it and want to put a bow on it because the strength or they would view the strength of their religion as being comfortable with diversity and and um, conflict and contradiction. So again, I want to start historically and let us see then if Hinduism was never started by one person, where they don't have a founder, then where did it come from? How do you begin to trace it? Well, historians begin way back with a culture that they found in the Indus River, uh, Indus, uh, River Valley. Uh, People debate as to when this culture went on. The, the map that I'm showing you here kind of puts it in this area of, of 3300 to 2600 BC. So there's a culture there, and it, it, we think it was a very thriving culture. Some folks would put it earlier in this, some later, but this is kind of the consensus that there was this thriving culture in the Indus River Valley with large cities and complex social arrangements. And this is significant. This is a period of time that even predates Abraham. Most folks would say that Abraham is from the period, depending on how you read those texts, somewhere in the area of 2000 to 1800 BC. That's when most people would date Abraham. So this Indus River Valley civilization, it predates Abraham. And so this group had this rich cultural religious tradition, and they've done a number of cities there, uh, Actually, this Harappan is one of the cities you can see in the slide, this reference to the Harappan culture. It's over a thousand cities have been uh, found and maybe a hundred of them have been been excavated. And they see a lot of parallels here and a lot of things that, a lot of pieces of religious history that have come to light. And what's clear from that tradition, along with the advanced nature of its civilization in terms of... um, industry and economy, there was a religious culture there too. So there were religious things going on and scholars debate as to how much of this religious tradition worked its way into what we currently know as Hinduism. But there are some roots that were definitely down there, vessels there. And this, uh, on this story you can see on my right, your left, it's, the, it's a bath, a great bath, which continues to be a central feature in Hindu religious worship. So some folks say that the roots of Hinduism can be traced all the way back to this early Indus River civilization, which predates Abraham even. We know also that there was an advanced kind of worship culture going on there. This schedule again on my left, which I believe is on your your right. Let's see. No, your left as well. My right, your left. That cult, that's a priest, a statue of an ancient priest. He's the, the kind of archaeologists call him the priest king. Again, from this era, showing that there was this representative that act as the intercessor between the gods and the people. So we know it had quite an advanced religious culture. We also have this female figurine of fertility goddess, perhaps. So there was a belief in uh, the multiple deities. So again, I point this out to say to you that when we're looking for the origin or the source of the Hindu faith, we're digging way back into history, probably predating Abraham. Well, into that culture, we have a series of events that folks, again, debate as to when this all happens, probably in the area of 1500 BC, which 
Again, if you're trying to equate that to the biblical history, depending on when you date the Exodus, which I date somewhere around 1400 BC, that's my thought on the matter. Some people date it later around 1200, but I say it's around 1400. So about 100 years before the Exodus is what we're talking. Some folks began to make their way into this Indus River area. And scholars debate about whether to call it invasions. For a long time, it was kind of regarded as this Aryan invasions. But later scholarship began to wonder, were they really invasions? In other words, were they military invasions or were they just kind of a movement of people that began to settle and slowly take over the culture? And these invasions kind of, or resettlements, if you will, began to change the culture of the Indus River area. And out of these cultures, you began to get the deep scriptural traditions that began to inform what we now know as Hinduism. So uh, just a word on this word Aryan, uh, I know it's a controversial term. And I point it out to you because your familiarity with Aryan, most of the Western world, your familiarity with the word Aryan comes from the days of Nazism, right? And this idea of the Nordic, uh, Germanic, you know, primordial person, that, that, that's, that's how we know the word Aryan. Well, the truth is that's a corruption of the original meaning. The actual origin of the term had to do with Iran and this proto-Iranian culture that probably is the source of this people known as the Aryan people. It simply means they come from this proto-Iranian culture. And so just to be clear, when we're talking about this Aryan culture coming into the area, we're not talking about Germans or Nazis or anything like that. We're talking about a proto-Iranian culture that moved its way into this area of the Indus River Valley and brought with them some religious traditions that definitely began to form what we now know as Hinduism. And there's two periods to this time of the Aryan incursion, or however you want to place it. And scholars generally divided into an early Vedic period and a later Vedic period. And uh, the only reason I point this out is, one, to show that it starts up in this kind of north, northwestern quadrant of, of India and Pakistan, what we now know as India and Pakistan, and then began to push its way to the east and to the south. And it's really in the later Vedic, Vedic period that it begins to go further east and further south. So it kind of spreads there. And kind of the, one of the reasons why I point out these two stages of development, in the early stages, they seem to be more pastoral, that is, shepherds and that kind of thing. And then as they stayed there longer, it develops more into an agrarian society, a more settled society. The agrarian piece begins to develop as in this late Vedic period. The other reality that begins to happen is that this is the period of the development of the some, some fundamental Hebrew scriptures, the earliest scriptures that we have that become known as Hindu scriptures. Some start in this earlier Vedic period, others develop more in the later Vedic period, and they rough, that development roughly parallels these two periods. So we want to spend a little bit of time tonight talking about the Hindu scriptures. Again, there's no one set. There's nothing like a Bible that you can go to of Hinduism and say, this is the whole truth. There are thousands and thousands and thousands of pages, dozens and dozens and hundreds of books that collectively form what we know as the Hindu scriptures. And there's really two levels of scripture in the Hindu tradition. Um, one level is called Shruti. That's, and literally from Sanskrit, that's that which is heard. In other words, that's revelation from the gods. It has the highest level of authority. That's folks that have reflected on this, great teachers that have listened to the gods. They're considered authoritative. They're the ultimate kind of truth that you have to kind of associate with. And Two examples of Shruti scriptures, one is the Vedas, which we'll talk about, and another is the Upanishads, which, which we will also talk about. The Vedas were roughly written during that early Vedic period, and the Upanishads come along later in that later 
Vedic period. So that's kind of the fundamental scriptures that we're going to look at. There's another level of authority there. The term there is Shmriti, and that means that which is remembered. That's traditions. They don't have quite the authority of the higher level, the Shriti, but they have their commentaries on life. The Puranas and some of these other literature, they kind of fill in the gaps that you don't find in the Vedas and the Upanishads. Some folks have compared it maybe to the Roman Catholic tradition that sees the scriptures as one type of scripture and then they get these other things called the Apocrypha as a second level of scripture. Some folks have made that analogy. I'm not sure that I agree with it entirely, but it gives you a little bit of idea. It's kind of two levels of scripture, right? So uh, let's talk a little bit about those scriptures because they do inform what we think of in terms of what Hindus believe. Before we talk about the individual works, though, we need to say something about this language, Sanskrit. Um, that's the text, the sacred text. The language is earlier. It seems earlier than Hebrew. I mean, even if you believe that um, Moses wrote the Pentateuch, which I do, you're still talking in the area of 1400 that Hebrew is written. So we're not sure exactly when the language itself originated, various theories. We, uh, but it looks like Sanskrit was probably around before that. And so um, it is this language that gets passed around and written in these early cultures. We're not sure. For a long time, it was an oral language. It didn't get written down probably maybe even into the current era, that is after the birth of Christ sometime that begins to be written. But it's, it's a language in which the Vedas and the Upanishads are written. It's another whole language which it's interesting if you go out there and try to understand it and read it, but it's a, an amazing artful language. It, it has all kinds of inflections and the reason I bring it up to you is, again, you're going to be in this tradition of trying to interpret what these ancient scriptures mean, and we're going to have to put them into English to understand what they are, but every time you put something into English, you're going to lose something in the translation. So we always have to reach a little bit, and I just want to make you aware which is of the obvious that when we're looking at some of these ancient scriptures, we're going to be reading them in English, but believe it or not, these ancient folks didn't write them in English. <laughs> they wrote them in this language called Sanskrit. And just so you get an idea of what it looks like here, uh, here's an example of an of a 11th century manuscript of uh, what Sanskrit can look like. So you can look at that and have that with you in your notes. So the Vedas then were written in this language called Sanskrit. And let's talk a little bit about the Vedas. Um, again, I said that the Rig Veda, there's four, four of these. Um, and the most important, by far the most important, is the Rig Veda. Uh, it's some 1,000, 1,000, or great, more than 1,000 hymns that are written in Sanskrit. And they're arranged according to the God that they ascribe to. The way these things are written is various families penned hymns to the God that they worshipped. And so these hymns are kind of arranged mostly according to the God that is worship in those hymns, and they're kind of assigned to families over the centuries that put these things together. So uh, that's kind of, and that, that's kind of the most important, or the, at least in Hebrew tradition, or in Hindu tradition, the most important of the Vedas. The other, in some ways, kind of just build on what the Rig Veda have to say. Uh, the Yajur Veda is those same hymns, mostly those same hymns rearranged, but according to the sacrifice and according to the worship ritual that you need. So it's a rearrangement. Same thing with the, Soma, uh, the same Avada Veda. Those hymns are arranged by musical accompaniment. In other words, kind of as how you would accompany musically. So for the folks that are playing along and accompanying the priest's singing of these hymns. So they're a repetition there are, um, the Arthavara Veda is an interesting one. It contains a lot of incantations and spells and particular advice for things like if you have a cough, what you have to pray, the song you have to sing. In fact, some of the, this, this Veda was sometimes in some of the local cultures viewed as so powerful that you really had to be 
well initiated before you even brought this one up. It's been attributed, for example, miscages, miscarriages among women. If women accidentally read this, they would have a miscarriage because it was such a powerful thing. So it was one of those books or scriptures that you weren't supposed to touch unless you were initiated. So um, again, looking at the Rig Veda, that's kind of the source of the beginning. It's kind of the first scriptures where you barely begin to see clearly uh, what it is that would later be defined as Hindu tradition. And again, these Vedas were probably not written down into till the 4th or the 6th century after Christ. Up until that point, these Rig Vedas were probably just passed down from generation to generation for a thousand years or so, passed down from generation to generation orally through priests and through family worship. So again, uh, Interesting. In fact, our first, our oldest surviving manuscripts of these actually come from the 10th century, maybe some 500 years or so after, or 600 years after they were originally written down. So uh, again, we have to do a bit of a mm, comparison of these texts and try to write them out to really know what they were initially. But uh, as always, the scholars have done their best to give us a real look at what these Rig Veda may have said to us. So just to give you a little example. Um, here, what it would look like. This is an image of the Rig Veda. It's not from the 19th century, and you can kind of get a feel of what that would look like in its original um, Sanskrit. And to get an idea of what it, what it says, I took the first two verses that are in English from an old English translation. So this is the Rig Veda, book one, chapter one, verses one and two, all right? This is uh, what you have, and it, the words go, I loud ag agni, the chosen priest, God, minister of sacrifice, the hotar, which is the priest, the, the Hindu priest, uh, lavishness of wealth, worthy is Agni to be praised by living as by ancient seers, he shall bring hitherward the gods. Uh, this is a hymn to the fire god Agni. He, he was the one who in the smoke and in the fire of, of the sacrifice, the prayers and the wishes of the people would go up to the gods or in this case, Agni, he delivered the message to the gods through what the priest did. He was in the fire, in the smoke. And so this opening prayer of the Vedas is, take this prayer, take this power. You are worthy to be praised as this communicator, if you will, as this agent of inspiration and agent of help as we intercede with the gods. So that's kind of the first words right out of the Rig Veda, so... So, which leads us to talk about the deities, the deities, the gods and goddesses that you find within the Vedas. There's an amazing story, ancient tradition of a gentleman who in India decided he wanted to know how many gods are worshipped in India. And so... He went around to all the villages and all the castes and all the clans and he took a list and he was keeping a list of all the gods that were worshipped all the way through the land. He spent his whole life recording the names of these gods and he finally got home. He was 93 years old. It took him his whole life to compile the list. So the tradition goes. And the tradition says when he was all done, he had penned and written down the name of 330 million gods and goddesses worshipped in the country. But when he was so exhausted, they finally asked him, how many really did you find out there? And his answer was one. There is one God <laughs> worshipped in India. So again, this, this comfort level with paradox. There's 330 million and yet there's one. And for the average Hindu, that is not a contradiction. That is not something that a logical either or. Both are entirely possible. Both are entirely okay. And we're going to see why in a little while. But uh, so there are plenty of gods that emerge out of the Vedas. And, you know, unauthorized or, I mean, uninitiated, you read through those and you, you say to yourself, how could anybody believe in all these gods, and they're kind of weird stories and weird creation. How does anybody believe any of that? And you, you say to yourself, wow, this is weird. Unless you begin to see that in the eyes of the Hindu, these are all avatars, if you will, or 
representations of the one God that is. And so these all are stories that give you an insight and a perspective and an attribute of God that you didn't know about. So on that level, they'll not really be taken literally as you and I would take literal history. They're stories that help you understand the different attributes of God and how God manifests himself in all these different ways and in all these different faces. That's the comfort level that the Hindus have with these different gods. So I was going to give you a list of all 330 million, but I kind of ran out of time. So instead, we're going to give you kind of, just so you see four of them that you see. And, and the one was Agni, which you've seen already, the god of fire. He's kind of this go-between, this messenger, if you will. We have Varuna, the god of order. And there's this concept of Rita, Rita in, in Hinduism, which basically is order and structure. This is the god in the Vedas that keep order and structure in the universe. Indra is kind of by far the most powerful, kind of the most dramatic god, I think, in, in the Vedas. He's the god of war. He's the one that's in charge of the storms. Uh, he's the one in charge of unleashing the authority and the, and the justice of God upon the world. And then there's this interesting um, god by the name of Soma, the god of sleep. But also the word becomes an intoxicating beverage and the two are related. <laughs> this idea that your mind, again, we saw this in some of the other indigenous cultures, that there are drinks that can liberate your mind, smoke that can liberate your mind and begin to really talk to the gods. And in the Hindu tradition, this is Soma. So anyway, that's... That'll give you just, again, some of the general ideas, some of the basic gods that you see as you read through the Vedas. The other important distinguishing feature of the Vedas is this idea of Varna. And in English, this has been translated as a class system, as a caste system. There's a lot of debate as to whether class or caste is the appropriate word. Does it really mean that? And then there's additional complications because the word varna really means color. So does this have to do with the color of your skin? Well, obviously not. It has to do with some sort of level of society. So whatever, again, you have this struggle with translating this word into English, but it has something to do with your place. Your place in society, where you belong. There's a role that you're intended to fulfill. It's a role that's given to you based upon who came before and what came before. And you have a responsibility to that order. You're not to break out of it and try to move up the chain. This is by virtue of who you are. This is part of how you were created in this world. And so for the first kind of uh, mention of this, you began to see it in some of the Vedas. And uh, the story kind of goes that that first primordial man is divided and his mouth becomes the top layer, becomes the Brahmins. The mouth is the priesthood. They're the pure ones. They speak the truth. They're the ones that are supposed to, in culture, keep the truth alive, keep the tradition alive, keep people in order, speak the truth. They're at the top and, and perform these rituals and sing these songs to make sure that all of society is conforming with what gods, the gods want. And the Kshatriyas were the next level. They were your warriors, your kings, your political leaders. They were, they were cultivated out of the arms of this primordial man. They were the ones, the force, the strength, the ones who enforce the will of the gods in society. The next level is the Vaishyas. They're the, the common people, the merchants, the craftsmen, the folks that kind of work in the shops. They, they're the next level. They're, they're given the responsibility of creating and cultivating the society. And the fourth caste or class or level, depending on how you interpret this, is the shudras. They're, they're the laborers. They were cultivated out of the feet. By the way, the vaishyas were cultivated out of the legs, the thighs, in the story, in the creation story. The shudras are crafted out of the feet. They're the laborers. They're the farmers. They're the ones that Get it, the servants. They're supposed to be there to serve the other layers of society. 
And so as you're born, there is this level of expectation about where you fall. And this is an ancient system that goes back hundreds, even thousands of years. But the truth is, in India today, it's still an influence. It's still a cultural reality. Now, obviously, the castes maybe aren't as ironclad as they were at one point in time, but it's still a reality there that folks deal with. So, and its origins go way back to this starting place of, of Hindu thinking. And then, of course, in addition to these, well, let me just say something about these layers, if you will. The top three layers are what's called the twice-born. Those are the ones who are moving up in their salvation tree. Uh, we're going to talk in a while about how you are saved in this tradition, how you are rescued. But they're the folks that are moving up in their cycle of release. They, they can be engaged and try to move up. The rest of the, the shudras, they're there to serve and hope that by doing and serving well, you can move up to the next layer on your next life. Now, and outside of these four varnas, if you will, there are the avarna, the not varnas, the people that lie outside. You probably know them as the untouchables. This is the group that doesn't even get to make it. They're, you can't even touch them. And the idea there is, if the Brahmins especially, they were the pure ones that are supposed to take our, uh, be the mouthpiece for God's word and everything, they can't be contaminated by people that, that have this stuff in them. And so you have this whole other class, and there are people that worked with, in, you know, with leather and worked with hides and things that um, were not pure things. And outsiders and foreigners, those are, those are untouchables. They can't be a part of this. And so you have this class that weren't even included. And of course, those of you who know the life of Mahatma Gandhi, that was one of his biggest concerns, is how we have this culture in, in India. Of I mean, it makes no sense. They become a major power source and power base for him. But this layer system, it goes way back. And there's a lot of debate about, you know, is this based on race and skin tone? Well, probably not. That was thought at one point, but that was probably, again, Western ideas imported into a society. It probably didn't have anything to do with color of skin. And it, and it really had more to do with your function in society. Initially, it wasn't about wealth. It's not like the most wealthy people in society were the Brahmins. Well, they're not. So it wasn't really wealth. It wasn't really power. It wasn't really skin tone. It was your role. And it had to do with how you're born into this world and what your role is. And so it becomes very important in Hindu culture that you fill your role, whatever that is, whatever layer you're born into, you stick with that role. You do the best you can at that role. Even if it's wrong, even if it hurts you, even if uh, you get destroyed through following your way, you follow that path because that's, that's the role that's assigned to you. And so... Obviously, from a social perspective, that keeps order and structure, keeps everybody in their place. I dare say, in American culture, it probably doesn't go over that well, <laughs> right? Everybody thinks they can rise to the next level. But in the ancient Hindu culture, and certainly, I think, in, even to some extent in the current Hindu culture, there's this belief that you have to stay in your level, and that's a debate that continues to rage there. So, again, these are just some basic things that come out of the Vedas that began to inform Hinduism as we know it now. Now, beyond the Vedas, you have various commentaries that come along later that try to expand and extend the Vedas. The first are the Brahmanas, and, and that's interesting texts that try to explain the meaning of all these sacrifices that are called for and mentioned in the Vedas. Uh, what, what do they mean mystically? How ought they to be performed? What is the real substance of how they are to be done and what power is there? Uh, you have these texts uh, euphemistically referred to as the forest books. They're, they get even more mystical about these rites. What, what, are they, what are they really doing and saying? But by far the most influential, shall we say, commentaries is this 
group of texts known as the Upanishads. They're kind of written roughly in this late Vedic period. And they make an important switch from what the Vedas were teaching. The Upanishads start to look more mystically and more philosophically of what is the real essence of the Vedas. What is it saying? Behind all the stories, behind all the mythology, behind all the rituals, behind all the hymns, what really is being said about who I am and what I need to be? It's an attempt to really distill what's lying underneath the Vedas. In fact, some regard it as the end of the Vedas, the summary of the Vedas, if you will. The term itself, Upanishad, comes from this idea of sitting near somebody, sitting near to these great teachers and listening. What is it that they're saying about the deeper level of truth that come out of the Vedas? So uh, this is uh, the meaning of the Upanishads. And we're going to spend just a moment to talk about what's at the core of the Upanishads because they, again, form a fundamental concept or fundamental basis of what we find even in contemporary Hinduism. So let's look at some of these innovations. And they were innovations. The Upanishads were, over time, introducing new thoughts and new ideas. And it, some have noticed that the time that they're being introduced, it's probably not irrelevant that they came along at the time the Buddha began to speak. Maybe Buddhism began to have an effect on some of these teachings because they are more philosophical and they tend to take the power out of the Brahmins and out of the priestly class and they try to tell us that there's power in all levels of humanity. So at the top of this idea, the biggest kind of truth that comes clear in the Upanishads is this idea of Brahman. Brahman is... All is indefinable on one level. You, you can't say what it means. It's Brahman. As soon as you try to explain Brahman, you've messed it up. <laughs> so I'm going to mess it up because that's what we have to do. Brahman is this idea of ultimate reality. It's that which underlies. It's God without attributes. That's kind of what was underneath this story of there's one God in Hinduism. There, there's a God beyond attributes that underlies all these other gods. See, all these other gods, they're just avatars of Brahman at one level or another. See, you thought Avatar was a movie about blue people. Avatar is, is, is this image of God, this representation, this being, an incarnation, if you will, of God. So Brahman is that the root of this. You can never really know Brahman ultimately because Brahman is beyond attributes. It's beyond knowing. It's he, she, it is not personal. He's beyond person. He's before person. Now there is a personal side to Brahman. There is a way he chooses to reveal himself, if you will. But again, nobody can actually get to the real Brahman that's underneath. So that's really the fundamental, everything starts with Brahman, the, the ultimate reality that stands behind God, that stands behind us. So you start with this concept of Brahman, and then, but what's the human problem in the Upanishads? What are you trying to get out of? Well, it's this problem of samsara. That's the other kind of, at the other end, this, samsara is the problem of humanity in the Upanishads. What is samsara? It's the cycle of reincarnation. You've probably heard by now that reincarnation is an important part of the Hindu tradition. It is, but you should understand why. In, in the Hindu tradition, reincarnation is not a good thing. <laughs> you don't want it. You don't want to come back again and again and again. Samsara is this wheel that you're stuck on, that every time you die, you keep coming back, you keep coming back, you keep coming back. It's the nature of humanity. You just have to get recreated, recreated. And you have to be careful what you do in this life because it affects how often you keep coming back into this wheel. 
So this is the fundamental problem of humanity. It's, it's how do you escape this cycle of reincarnation? You just keep coming back over and over and over and over again. What you're looking for is this next word, it's moksha. And sometimes the A is silence, just pronounced moksha. But for many it's moksha. And what you're looking for is release. Can you just get out of this cycle of rebirth? Can you escape somehow from always coming back and back and back and back? So the goal then for humanity, according to the Upanishads, is to get released from this cycle of rebirth. But how do you do this? It's because, and how can you do this? It's because of what this next word is. It's called Atman. Atman in the Hindu tradition is our true spiritual center. It's, I guess, what we would call our soul. It's that true spiritual center that we have. And according to the Upanishads, the whole goal of you of getting out of this release is to realize that you and Brahman are one. There's no distinction. That somehow you're related to this force. In fact, the typical Hindu greeting, you bow. Part of that greeting is, I bow to the divine in you. It's this idea that in you is Brahman. And so you spend your life trying to get to that realization that Atman is Brahman. We are united to the divine. The divine is in us. And if we can get to that place where we can overcome all the stuff that divides us and prevents us and the illusion and the problem that separates us, we finally realize that Brahman and Atman, that we are, we can be united with the divine, we can be released from this vicious cycle of samsara. We can get moksha, release. Well, what keeps this wheel going and why is it that that it's so hard to do this? How, why is it you can't get released and be united with Brahman? Well, it's this problem called karma. Karma is this thing that keeps the wheel going. It's this force that keeps the wheel going. There's what they call good karma, there's bad karma, and there's neutral karma. Good karma is the more you do good, that piles up. The more you do bad, that, that piles up too. And that's all factored in as to whether you keep going in this wheel. And here's the way it works. You go through this life, you pile up good karma, bad karma. If you have more bad karma than good karma, then the next time you come back, you're a layer down. Like if you're a Brahmin and you don't do your job, you come back the next layer down or two layers down, depending how bad you are. I mean, you can come back as a bug. You can come back as all kinds of things. You can come back just karma is that powerful thing and you just don't want to leave this life with bad karma or you come back a layer down and you got to start all over again. When you die, there's kind of two directions in the Hindu, or Hindu Upanishad tradition. There's the way of the fathers, which is the human way, that you go through this celestial journey until you're back on earth in some other form. Or you can go the way of the gods, which is you can begin to your release so that you can escape samsara and be united with Brahman. So here's the bad news. The fact that you're here means you haven't made it yet. <laughs> You're still on the journey. You have not made it yet. You're still on the journey. And you bring that karma with you. So you got to work off the bad karma that you brought from your last life, and you got to pile on good karma to keep going. So it's this deep motivating factor to, to live rightly and live correctly and do what you got to do to get out of this spiritual law of karma that just keeps driving this wheel around and around and around. How do you get released from that? So according to the Upanishads, that's the fundamental 
point of humanity. That's why we do what we do. That's really the fundamental basis of our human problem. How are you released from this cycle of rebirth? And by the way, it's not just people. The universe is recycled over and over again. The cosmos gets recycled over and over again. Uh, we, from a Christian tradition, we like a beginning, a middle, and the end. We like you're born, you live, you die. We got one shot. That's our Western view. But in the Eastern tradition, especially the Hindu tradition, it just repeats itself over and over again. Universes repeat themselves over and over again. Lives repeat themselves over and over again. You're trying to escape from all that. And in essence, you're trying to not be. Because the fact that you are means you messed up. So you try to not be. That's at the center. Now, so, that's kind of where they leave you. But the, the question kind of emerges, well, what's the solution? I mean, we know the problem. The problem is this release from the cycle, this samsara, the, the, the release, how, that's the problem. How do we experience moksha? But what's the pathway? How do we do this? Well, a lot of literature comes along to try to suggest different pathways to escape the cycle of rebirth. One are the so-called so laws of Manu. Manu is, again, another story of a primordial man. And this lecture is, or this, these laws are supposedly handed down from the primordial man. Uh, scholars believe it was written somewhere in that time, 200 to years before Christ, to 200 after, somewhere in there, over various authors. And so one of the thoughts about how you experience release is you go through these stages of life and you do your duty as you go through these stages of life. You just do what you're supposed to do. We saw the caste system, do what you're supposed to do. Well, here's another, do what you're supposed to do. Live in the stage of life, do well at each stage. So the first stage, as a celibate student, study. Devote yourself to the study of the Vedas. Re re devote yourself to learning how you ought to uh, worship and how you, ought to be, how you ought to be a good person in the society. How to fill your varna your duty, your dharma. That's kind of the word for duty, responsibility, your dharma. Figure out how to fill that out. Around age 24, approximately, give or take, you need to move to the next level, which is a householder. And this obviously is talking about males here. But women have a similar um, life cycle they're supposed to go through. But in the laws of Manu, it's talking primarily about the men. They, they have to be a householder. They should get a wife. And by the way, that's not really viewed as optional. <laughs> I mean, if you're really going to do your duty, you, you have to get married. And so obviously there's this complex ritual that goes on and arranged marriages and all this stuff through most of the culture, obviously changed more recently, but this idea that you are responsible as a householder, you are supposed to produce children, you are supposed to lead the worship at home, keep the fires burning at home, you're supposed to lead your family in worship. Maybe we could learn a thing or two that from them when it comes to Christian faith, isn't it? <laughs> you're supposed to lead your household in faith. And then at a certain period of time, you go to uh, the equivalent of retirement. Then you're released from your obligation as a householder. And now you got to get ready for your next stage. And retirement is not go to the south of Florida and drink martinis till you go. That's not, that's not their view of retirement. Retirement is get ready for release. Doing an inventory of your karma. Do what you got to do so that when this life ends... You move up the chain. And then later, another stage was added, not so much from the laws of Manu, but there's this idea, too, that at some point there is this option open to everyone, regardless of where you are on life stage, that you can just check out. And this idea of renunciation, you can just check out of your duties and just spend the rest of your life in reflection, hoping for release. You can become this kind of 
uh, religious celibate devotee that's just trying to learn and experience Moshe. You can check out of these roles, but if you do, you have to be engaged in this quest to find release through reflection and meditation. That becomes your life. So really, the net net of this is, by the time you get to the end of the Upanishads, you really have two pathways to get release. On one level, you can stick with the way of the Vedas. And there's, in this case, you're, you're, you're focusing upon your actions. It's for the average person, if you will. It's the normal path. You focused on good action, your karma. Try to build up good karma. Try to reduce bad karma. Try to do more good things. Try not to harm people. Try not to do violence. Try not to be unloving. Do the things you need to do to build up good karma. And do what you need to do to suppress bad karma. So good actions. And if you do this correct and you do this over and over again, and by the way, chances are you're going to have to do this bunches and bunches of times. Very few people think they're going to escape from this in one lifetime. You know you're going to have to come back time and time again. This is, this is a cycle that goes on for a very, very long time. So all you can hope to do, you're probably not going to get release in this life, but you can come back a step better next life. And that's what you focus on. So good action. And that good action then results in a better birth, a better rebirth in this wheel of samsara. And so that means there's this emphasis upon you as an individual and your responsibility to do your duty by your caste and by your varna. So that's kind of one pathway is the regular ordinary way that through ritual, through devotion, through uh, uh, good karma, you're building your way to release. But now you have on the side this other way, this way introduced by the Upanishads, where it's not so much about this last option open to you. There's another window open, and that is to just reject action altogether, to check out, to distance yourself from this life and just focus on the next. So you kind of unplug from the day to day. You don't have a wife and you don't have a children and you don't have a job. You just focus your life on release. So it's no action. That, but that's an extreme view. But it's, it, if you do that right, it's a quicker escape route <laughs> than the ordinary life that you've got to keep coming back and coming back. If you do this route, if you want to take that chance, you can get there way faster. It's kind of the the quicker way to get there, but you have to check out and really focus. So it's not really based on your actions. It's based upon your checking out of action. And then the goal there is this no rebirth. And then that's a permanent solution. Then you don't come back anymore, which is a good thing in the Hindu tradition. You're united again with Brahman. So by the time the Upanishads kind of come to an end. You have this sense that there's these two pathways that you can possibly work through to gain your release from the wheel of rebirth of samsara. Well, then we get another layer. On top of the Upanishads, on top of the laws of Manu, we get another layer. And that comes along in these other great epics. And we began to turn a corner here in the development of Hinduism, which starts to introduce another whole way of release. Um, we have these two great epics, and we're not going to have a chance to cover them in detail, but I want to point them out to you. They're, they're two great stories. They're both very long stories. But both of them contribute to this another way, if you will, of liberation. The Ramayana, it tells this famous story of Prince Ryama, an avatar of Vishnu. As we're going to see next week, this god Vishnu becomes a very important feature of religious thinking and religious thought. In these later developments, he becomes, in many ways, one of the primary gods that are worshipped and followed. The Ramayana is, is the story of one of the avatars of, of Vishnu, 
uh, Prince Rama and his wife Sita and how they learn the way of release and what they learn about how they can be released from this wheel of moksha. And it's a lot of Prince Rama teaching his wife Sita of how to find that release. The one that you may know, be a little bit more familiar with is the, uh, the Mahabharata. Uh, the, the idea there, it's a long epic poem, uh, like four times longer than the Bible. Um, this is a story, a long story, and it's a story of this kind of battle of two families. Bharata, um, yeah, Bharata, it's, it's, it's a family name. And so this is the great story of the Bharatas, is what this is. It's this long tale of revenge between two families in the Hindu tradition. And so in the middle of that long story, there's this chapter, this section, where an incarnation of Vishnu by the name of Krishna. You've heard of Krishna before, right? Krishna now has a conversation with this Kshatriya clan member called Arjuna. And Arjuna is going into battle and he's dealing with this conflict of he doesn't want to go into battle and kill off his friends, his relatives, his neighbors. He knows people that he's going to be destroying. And so there on the plane of the battle, they're having this conversation. And that part of it, that section is called the Bhagavad Gita. You've probably heard of that, the Bhagavad Gita. That's, that's what this is. It's, it's part of this longer epic. And it's the story of this conversation that this avatar of Vishnu by the name of Krishna has with this leader. And the leader struggling with, how do I, what do I do in the face of this journey? The face of this um, battle. Do I do my duty as a, as a Vasha? Or I mean, yeah. Do I do my duty as a Kshatriya and go in and conquer? Or do I find some way out? And Krishna gives him this advice. So in that context, we actually, Krishna gives him three different options here about how he might want to come out of this wheel. There are three ways of salvation. So here again, this is going to be hard for us to process as Christian Western thinkers because there's only one way in our theology. But in Hindu, there's three, and that's a paradox, and that's okay. They don't have a problem with there being three different ways or four different ways or five different ways of salvation. Pick the one that works, right? Well, one way is the way of knowledge, the nana yoga. And, and, and yoga just means a spiritual discipline, a, discipline, a pathway. So one is just focus yourself on knowing. Find out what the truth is. Discover, rid your mind, rid your heart, rid, rid your thoughts of everything that's not true till you get to that place where you know Atman is Brahman, where you are united with God. So it's a way of knowing and thinking and understanding and focus and meditation. Go through that process. That's one way of salvation. That's one way of release from this vicious wheel of samsara. Another way we've talked about was karma yoga. That's the way of action. And so he says to his young, his, his master there, because Krishna is posing as the chariot driver, he says to his master, go the way of karma yoga, which is do your duty. Fight this war. Even if you die, even if you do it badly, even if you get killed, even if you have to kill anybody else, the higher good is you doing your duty. That's a pathway that will lead you to release somehow, some way. So do your duty. Follow that way. And then the other way, which becomes a whole other story, which we're going to have to pick up next week. The other way is this way of devotion called bhakti yoga. This way of devotion Find a God and worship him with all your heart. <laughs> and if that God is pleased, 
he may rescue you from samsara. He may pull you out. So one way to do it is find a God and worship God with everything you've got. And hope and pray that that God will rescue you. And with that context, Krishna actually makes this statement in the context of talking to Arjuna. And I, as a, given the biblical background that we share here, I thought it'd be an interesting to, for you to see a couple of these texts from the Bhagavad Gita. Krishna says, nothing is higher than I am, Arjuna. All that exists is woven on me like a web of pearls on a thread. He's, Krishna is revealing himself as an avatar of Vishnu that he is God. He's declaring he is God. That's what Krishna is doing. And he says, I am the self-abiding in the heart of all creatures. I am Vishnu striking among the sun gods. In other words, he is this thing that ties us and creation together. He is that way, if you will. So Krishna is making a claim very similar to, I think, what we see Jesus making. In fact, it gets even touchier than that. Uh, there's a story of one of the famous swamis that were there and a student went to him and he said, it's actually the Swami that founded the Hare Krishna movement, which, by the way, is even in that country's views as a cult, <laughs> just so you know. But anyway, he goes to the Swami and he asks, well, Swami, how, how can I experience moksha? How can I experience release? That's the, that's the question. And the Swami thinks for a long time and pauses as they do, before they speak. <laughs> he says very thoughtfully to the young man, hope that Krishna likes you. <laughs> and then there was a follow-up question, well, how can I make Krishna like me? And the Swami thought for a moment, very deeply, paused, responded, that's Krishna's business. <laughs> so just so we're clear, we said last week, you know, sometimes you get into this struggle that says religion is rules and Christianity is about relationship. And I said, be careful about that because what you've just done is you said in all these other religious traditions, there's nothing about relationship, nothing about grace, nothing about, and that's simply not true. I mean, in the bhakti side of things, in the bhakti religious side, there is a very clear teaching about God will love you. <laughs> and you will escape because God loves you. And so there's this mandate to worship. But as we're going to see next week, it's not just Krishna. You pick a God and worship. And we're going to talk about the mechanics of worship and all that. So... As we summarize here and we kind of set ourselves up for week two, and I keep saying next week, obviously two weeks from now, how do you begin to distinguish? So by now you're all thinking, uh-oh, I think he's going to become a Hindu. What are, I don't know. He's speaking with too much respect for this Hindu. Where, where do I come down as far as where do I think the tension point is? Now, obviously, I think there are a lot of parallels, and we can, we can talk about the parallels, but obviously, to me, the real distinction between we, where we as Christians are and where the Hindu religions come down and where I think the touch point is that we have to discuss is this basic problem of humanity. Now, again, if you were taking my class down at Gordon, I'd make you write an essay on this. So now it's just extra credit for you, right? But how would you compare the Hindu desire for moksha, this release, with the Christian hope of heaven? To me, that's where the real tension is in, in this thought. This idea that we don't live in this cycle of never-ending cycle with no hope of release. We live with a different teaching that talks about a certainty of a hope that happens at the end of this one life. <laughs> and to me, that's a fundamental distinction which should give us something to talk about without disregarding or without um, 
demeaning the other side with kind of blanket statements and generalizations. But I think there is something of substance here that we can talk about and realize there is a distinction, I think, a clear distinction between what Hinduism would see as the central problem and where in some ways we would agree, I think, we, they call it karma, we call it sin. There's something that condemns us to judgment. There's something that condemns us to judgment. But we would not agree upon the, what that judgment is, and we would not agree on how you're released from that judgment. And I think there's a real point of comparison there, and if I were to write the essay, I would start there. So oh, we'll see if my students think the same way. <laughs> All right, with that in mind, let's... Um, let's see, how do I do this? I think I need to close in prayer and then we're going to take some questions. Is that how this works? Um, and then we'll kind of go from there. Father, thank you so much for this time together, for this reflection upon your truth. And again, all truth is God's truth. So we're always looking for uh, insights and correctives and just ways to make sure that that glass we look through darkly, that we just get a little more light into it. And most of all, that we listen to our brothers and sisters from other traditions and just speak to them with respect and speak to them with clarity and speak to them with understanding as we together try to discover this God that you've revealed and as we together decide or change our life, motivate our life towards this way that you've taught us through your son. And this we ask in the name of your son, Christ Jesus. Amen.